Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. To Microsoft Time. My name is Mike Barnett. I'm here to introduce Terence Parr, who I'm very happy has come to visit us. Uh, Terence is well remembered for his original quote that it's uh, why spend five days, was it five days, right? Pro no, why, why, programming something by hand that you could spend five years automating, which led to his work in developing the PCCTS compiler gen uh, uh, parser generator, and which has continued with his antler work. And uh, is now a faculty member at the University of San Francisco and here to tell us about template engines. He brought some copies of his paper here, which uh, is the first time I've ever seen the word emasculate used in an abstract, so I would recommend it for no other reason than that. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Terrence is free all day, so if any of you would like to have time to meet with him during the day, just come up after the talk or uh, send me an email, and we'll schedule something for today. So without anything else, here's Terrence. So, uh, well, thanks for the opportunity to come uh, present some of my research today. Um, specifically, I want to talk to you about the generation of text, whether it be HTML, source code, whatever. I will be talking about my string template engine, which is, uh, as you'll see, something that um, allows you to automate some of the grungy work and helps you enforce uh, an important programming principle. So between all of us here, I'm sure that we've generated an enormous amount of output, right? Particularly text output. <clears throat> I'm guessing that if you're like me, you have a bunch of programs that are rather unbecoming of a computer scientist. Probably a bunch of programs with print statements in them and so on. So, have you ever wondered if there was a, well, a good way to do it? Is there a right way? Is there anything about the problem itself that tells us what the solution should look like? I feel very strongly that it is the case. So, in case some of you doze off, I think I'll summarize my main point right away. Have you ever noticed that cars, at least the low end, they're all starting to look the same? It's, it's essentially the fact that, well, I guess except for the Scion. Have you seen this thing? It's like a makes my old Volvo look like a jet fighter. That thing is not so much boxy as it is a box. But <clears throat> for the most part, cars are starting to look similar. It's because aerodynamics has come to mean more than style and individuality in an effort to eke out more and more gas mileage. So you might say that the nature of the problem is starting to define and mean more than, you know, it's basically it's the most important design characteristic. So think about what happens when you generate text. In a similar fashion, you're not generating random characters, are you? I mean, you're generating some kind of format. So that means a language. It's a sentence in a language. Now, I don't need to convince any of you that if you're describing a language, you should use a grammar. Okay, so what I'm saying is the nature of generating text should mean we, be, we should be doing something that's akin to an output grammar. Now, the thing is, we don't use output grammars, right? What do we have? Well, we have these sort of undignified programs that have a bunch of print statements in them and, you know, or some other similar mechanism. It's just kind of an ad hoc solution, right? So um, in an effort to ameliorate the situation, people came up with these template engines, hoping to kind of separate out the logic from the display part or the dumping of text part, the model and the view, you know, however you want to think about it. So they specifically designed these things to help you separate the model and the view. Unfortunately, uh, most of these are unrestricted, and so they just they look like you just move the code from, uh, you know, a, a program with print statements to a bunch of literals with code in it. And I'll show you an example in a second. Now, the interesting part is, if you start to enforce this really important programming principle of separation of model and view, and I'll talk about some of the really great benefits in a second, if you start to enforce that rather than encourage, you get a tremendous amount of selection pressure towards something that looks remarkably like a grammar. So the point is that I've got two sides of this equation, the nature of the problem itself 
and enforcing an, a, re, a really important principle when it comes to generating anything that has a format. You've got both sides providing uh, selection pressure to make this thing look like, sort of like a grammar. So I'm going to go ahead and make a bold statement that if you, sh if you are generating text, unless there's some other overriding you know, problem you're trying to solve, if you're generating text, HTML, source code, whatever, it should look something like string template, an output grammar, something like that. So briefly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about templates, define them, talk about the separation, what are the rules that guarantee this, show you briefly the uh, equivalence to a context-free grammar, just to show that uh, we can leverage some results from formal language theory. Um, I'll actually describe the string template engine itself, and I'll give you hopefully a motivating example. And, uh, and then finally, I'll try to give you uh, sort of some of my experience so far using this thing to actually build the new Antler 3 prototype, the code generator. So because HTML highlights separation issues very well, I thought I'd use HTML at the beginning to show you some of the problems. So we all start out with this sort of servlet-like thing, at least in the Java space, or whatever this is. It doesn't matter what your language is. You notice that it's mostly literals and then a little bit of computation, right? Now, what they've decided was, oh, hey, wouldn't it be great if we just inverted it so the literals were sort of the first-class thing here? And then the execution part was just an embedded little language. Well, that really didn't get you anywhere in terms of separation, although it you know, reduces your typing. Because what happens? Well, people start embed. They, they just moved the problem into a new programming language. Many of them, well, JSP actually makes you use Java inside there. But So what you start to see is logic. Think about it. Why would I want logic in my view? If the, user, the super user becomes somebody other than Part T, then I have to go change every single template I've got in my system. You can't do computations in there easy, either because what if the, you know, the sale price is not 10% off anymore or you know, the, the, the AMA keeps dropping that damn blood pressure on us. Um, and so you don't want this logic in your template. That should be a, that's, that's part of your computation. It's part of your model or your controller. And I've seen this in students, and I've seen it in real, real world stuff. Database queries in your view? Excuse me? I mean, that's just crazy. You change your schema, and you've got to go change every single view in your system. It's nuts. Um, well, let's see. One of the other interesting ones. There's a company called Squarespace that was using the Velocity template engine, if, if you are familiar with that. And they were, there's a hosted application kind of thing where people can publish and do blogs and so on. But what was happening is they had a number of malicious attacks where because it's a totally unrestricted template, when you expose this template system to a user, they can, well, ask the class loader to do something naughty. And so, um, and just think about it. If you give me a loop, simple denial of service attack is an infinite loop, right? So um, the other thing is you can't really assume types. If ID becomes a string instead of, you know, a numeric value, then, you know, that's part of your program. So there's a lot of subtle things. The, uh, the last entanglement you'll see is that um, sometimes people will put still some like formatting stuff in their code and then shove it into the template. Unfortunately, it's undecidable whether you can prevent this or not because is red the name of a color or is it a man's name? So there's some things you just can't decide, or at least you can't enforce. So just briefly summarize these things because I'm sure you all are familiar with the benefits of this um, separation of logic and, uh, logic and display. You know, when you want to go figure out how something's being computed, you really want the logic to be completely encapsulated within one particular spot. And when you want to know how it looks, well, you want to go to one particular spot. You don't want to have to go, you know, mess around and figure out where everything is. You also don't want to have to be t pretend to be a computer, right? You don't want to have to imagine the emergent behavior of some particular program. You want to see, well, well, there it is. It's an ex exemplar, okay? Uh, well, division labor really only matters in the web world, but we repeatedly at JGrew, this uh, uh, Java developer site uh, company that I started, um, we repeatedly verified that our graphics designer was able to work completely in parallel with me. She was able to design all sorts of stuff while I was able to set up the logic. And the only way we communicated was, you know, which templates I'm going to fill and which ones she can use, which attributes I'm going to fill and which ones she can use. 
um, you know, component reuse, single point of change. I mean, you get it, right? If I if I um, have everything completely separated, it's easy for me to get my search box to go, you know, put it out somewhere. Or, uh, you know, how does a, a method look? It's easy for me to separate that out. Further, if I've got this component reuse, then I can do this whole single point of change thing. The only way um, a link looks on my site or the only way that uh, a function declaration looks in my output is used right here. So I change it one spot, it changes everywhere. It's much safer to change a template than it is to change a program. So maintenance-wise, it's a huge issue. And you start to get thousands and thousands of these templates and hundreds of thousands of lines of code and so on. All of these things start to make a huge difference. I mean, if you're just generating some small program, none of these, it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> one of the cool things about enforced separation is that it essentially is a guarantee that I can retarget my system. So with a new Antler code generator, um, there's absolutely no output literals in my code. And there's no logic in my templates that say, you know, how to generate a parser. So all I have to do in principle is to switch these templates and magically it'll generate another language as long as it has the right set of attributes and so on. So the problem with the existing engines, at least that I saw, is that they don't enforce, they actually encourage. So it's kind of like, well, how many people remember the IBM keyboard, uh, the or original IBM PC, where you plug the keyboard in the back and it has two little slots that look exactly the same. And one is the cassette and one is the keyboard. And a good way to fry your keyboard was to stick it in the wrong hole. So it, was, it wasn't keyed in any way. So, I mean, if we have the opportunity to enforce a principle that is important, we should do it, as long as we don't destroy our power. So, in general, they, I think they kind of get caught up building, you know, languages. Wow, it's fun. We all want to do that. Um, but they kind of fear, well, there's going to be something I can't generate. Because nobody's really studied this formally. It's just a bunch of ad hoc you know, work. Nobody's really studied it formally. It's, it's hard to say, theoretically, what the power of these things are. So, of course, what you end up with is a bunch of fully entangled specifications, just like, you know, the old version of Antler. I mean, you've got this massive code generator. You want to make, instead of a Java code generator, you want to make uh, C Sharp or whatever. You have to cut and paste the whole thing. you got the view and you got the code all mixed up in this big mess. <clears throat> so it turns out I have a great deal of empirical evidence from my work in the, um, you know, building these large websites as well as now in the code generation area, I have a great deal of empirical evidence to suggest that we can have the best of both worlds, that you can have uh, enforced separation as well as um, uh, you know, power. And I've, in the paper, I've got some theoretical support for that as well, which I'll show you in a sec. So just so we're talking about the same thing here, unrestricted template is just a, s a series of alternating literals and expressions. These expressions are computationally not limited, nor are they limited in any kind of syntactical, uh, syntactical way. <clears throat> so these clearly don't enforce any kind of separation. The interesting point here is that um, I hear people talking about SSLT and all these you know, XML translation systems as, uh, as template engines. They may be useful. They may be interesting. Well, not to me, but they might be. But they're not template engines. They're not exemplars, right? <clears throat> it's like prologue. You give it a list of rules. You know, Bob is Mary's, you know, brother. You know, John is so and so. And then you go, well, what's the answer? And if it doesn't work, you go, huh? It's just this black box, right? It's the same with XSLT. It's a set of rewrite rules. So it may be fine. It may be good, but it's not a template engine. It's not an exemplar. <clears throat> so we'll, <clears throat> we'll see in a second how this can get morphed into grammar. All right, so how is it that, you know, is there a set of rules that can enforce separation? Turns out, yes. I think I've gotten it down to these five. And I've slightly tweaked them, I think, in my mind since this paper. The basic idea is, if your program, if your view can modify the model, it's part of the program, right? I mean, if it's updating the database, it's part of the program. If it's doing computations, it's doing, you know, all sorts of conditional logic inside there. It's also part of the program. If there's, you know, order dependencies and so on, it's part of the program. Um, you can't really assume anything about types. Well, first of all, graphics designers don't know anything about types. In the code generation world, yeah, we know all about types and all that kind of stuff. But it's actually a dependency. If you assume something's an integer and then all of a sudden becomes a non-numeric value and becomes a string, then you're going to break something. 
And worse, you're not going to know you broke it until you use that template a year down the road. Somebody sends you a bug report. You're like, what? So finally, you don't want your code to be computing formatting information and then pushing it in. It's the same as doing a print statement, right? It, it, it's handling your spec. So how are we going to make a template enforce this? Well, there's some easy ways. First thing we do to prevent the model from getting modified, we make sure that all data is computed a priori, and we push it in as a set of read-only attributes. I mean, it's essentially impossible if the data is prepared ahead of time, and I can't make method calls back into the model. It's impossible for us to modify that model that way. So I'm going to restrict those little expressions. Instead of you know, arbitrary junk, <clears throat> I'm going to restrict them to be either attribute references or template references. And these can be recursive, and I could be applying a template to a series of values. We'll see that in a second. But I'm restricting them severely. But it turns out, I'll show you to get to the next slide, that even these restricted templates can generate the context-free languages because I'll show that any der any, the derivation for any sentence can be mimicked with a set of nested template structures. So that's kind of an encouraging result, right? Because at that point, um, since an XML DTT is essentially a context for grammar, or something akin to it, that means that at least syntax-wise, even such a restricted template can generate all of these context-free languages. And remember, most of our programming languages, of which you know, we're generating these things, uh, most of those are going to be LL1 or something you know, very easy to parse. So not even the full context-free languages. Um, and then, of course, by allowing uh, conditional inclusion, it's kind of like allowing predicated grammars, which, in principle, could be you know fully turn complete and the type zero Chomsky uh, level. But um, so the key is, I'm not saying if some arbitrary expression. You'll see in a second. It's basically testing the presence or absence of an attribute. Seems like that's the only thing that's uh, legal without breaking some rules. So on the left, I've got a grammar and some mythical, uh, OK, it's antler. Um, but so I've got some grammar over here. This is what we use to recognize languages. Let's invert it, kind of like the whole you know, Visual Basic ASP or, or Servlet JSP thing. Let's invert it. And so now the, the double quotes here represent you know, a template. And then the ang double angle brackets represent like a multi-line template. So it's almost like uh, the old EDNF style where you had angle brackets to reference other rules, if you remember that syntax. But anyway, so this is essentially just an inverted uh, grammar. It's just more convenient, like it is with JSP versus servlet, to um, just be able to reference literals like the semicolon and so on, and then have all these, you know, the white space and everything taken care of. Because um, here, you know, none of that is encoded. So it turns out, I won't you know, bore you with a, the sketch of a proof or anything, but if you equate attributes, this sort of linear stream of attributes coming in as a token stream, and then you equate templates with rules, which seems fairly clear, then you can pretty much easily show that you know, any sentence you can generate with a grammar that looks like this, you can generate with something that looks like that. It's just kind of a different notation. But it requires that you restrict all this, right? You're not, you don't see like, oh, this is like the result of decal times 96. OK. Put the uh, clock or oh, There we go. OK. So the, the parentheses is a call to a person call? Yeah, I look, it's, like a, it's like a function call. OK. And then the other ones are queries to your data model. Your data model right? That's right. So um, this is so anything that doesn't have these parentheses on here, this is just a reference to the ID attribute. You can think of it as essentially a hash table lookup. Now, are those contextual at all? Like, I mean, could I have could I have one template that takes a list of IDs and then sort of you know execute function based on? That? I don't know. I mean, yeah. It's well, this can be either a single or multi-valued attribute. So in this case, I'm assuming it's just one, and it'll just you know spit it out. But if this were multiple, it, you know, if this if I had set ID like 40 times, it would spit out 40 things. And as uh, I think uh, 
well, when I actually do the, the string template stuff next, you'll see that if this were a list of things, or even if it's a single value, I can apply a grammatical structure to that list. So, for example, if I have a, um, a uh, list of names, let's just do some HTML stuff. If I have a list of names coming in, and I wanted to bold each one of those, if I have a template called bold, then I can just say, you know, names, colon, bold, and then it will, like, you know, Python map or Lisp or whatever your favorite um, functional language is, it will take that template and go like a cookie cutter and apply that against all those attribute values. Okay. And so that's how you end up getting these recursive structures. Right? You've got to be able to apply a template such as this recursively, where I guess a better example is a statement list or something like that. You've got to be able to, given a list of attributes or tokens, if you want to think about it that way, You've got to be able to apply a rule to each one of those things, and then each one of those may be a nested structure and so on. And so template engines that just have, like, this is like an include, right? And, of course, if you have um, arguments in there, then it's a macro. But they limit it at that. Even if they allow it to recurse on itself, it's not the recursive application to a series of these token streams. So you've got a big token stream, and you want to break it up into um, uh, this is a statement list, and then this part's a statement list, and then this part. Unless you get that notion of recursive application, instead of just function call, you don't actually get um, the ability to generate, you know, nested statement list and so on. So I kind of got stuck building websites for four or five years, and we started out using uh, JSP. And I quickly found in our first version that it was impossible to change anything because we had all of this logic stuck in all these pages. And, you know, it's just, it's, well, JSP in general is just kind of a horrible model to, to build websites with. But I said, okay, for the next version, as I completely rewrote this system, I said, well, it seems like that what we really want is to show here's the page and then there's a bunch of holes to fill in. And I knew that wasn't the answer because I knew that couldn't possibly be powerful enough. But I said, all right, I'll start with that. And then ruthlessly enforcing, because of the heinousness that I saw when I was trying to build JSP pages, I would ruthlessly enforce the strict separation so that there's nothing that can go in the view except, you know, data references or something like that. And I said, oh, well, I need to include the header or I need to include a search box. Okay, so I'll allow that. And so this thing has kind of like risen and, and fallen in feature set as I did this experiment in software engineering over the past four or five years. And uh, as uh, the gentleman um, at Squarespace is using this for his um, for exposing to his uh, his bloggers, he says, uh, "Oh, I get it. Spring template should be as stupid as possible, but no stupider." I mean, he's trying to you know he, he's watched as the feature set kind of went up, you know, has gone up and down. So I learned a very very valuable lesson that it's almost impossible to build a large site, or and now I'll see with a, a large code generator that you can't possibly entangle these things and uh, get any value beyond just writing a program. So one of the things that was clear to me was that I couldn't have side effects. I mean, when I reference something, I, I can't have it, uh, you know, go erase the hard drive. I can't modify the database. And so assignments were out. You just think about it. If I got an assignment up here, then clearly I'm going to want to reference it somewhere else. If order of execution matters, it's a program. Because what's the graphics designer going to do? Take this, oh, I want this at the top. Now all of a sudden, heck, the thing probably wouldn't even compile if you were generating code. So it's very uh, important that we have no side effects because that essentially uh, guarantees that I don't care about the order of execution. Now on a multi-threaded system or a parallel system, cool. I'll have multiple CPUs attacking this problem. And as I've talked about, you've got to have some kind of notion, some notion of recursion. You can't generate hierarchical menus. You can't generate nested code structures without something akin to recursion. The other interesting thing that I found was that uh, dynamic scoping is really, really useful. In other words, you know, lexical scoping, where you have, uh, like in, a, in a, a programming language, like C or something, you have variables. And if you call another function, you can't see the variables. Now, they're on the stack, right? I mean, if you, you know, generate any code, you know that those variables are on the stack somewhere. And in principle, I could walk backwards and check what those values are, but they're, they're, they're lexically scoped. They're not meant to be accessible to the subfunctions. 
Well, you can imagine if you're generating code and you're deep in the middle of, uh, I don't know, some method, you're trying to generate code for this thing, and you want to make a unique variable. Well, one of the things you could do is just prefix it. Let's say it was a global, but it's emanating. It's coming from this function, so I want to make it like you know f underscore i. But I want to put it at the global level and so on. When you need access to the scope that's above me so that I can ask what the function name is. And if, otherwise, I'd have to like pass it down in. If you've done uh, any grammar work or whatever, you know the typical attribute mechanism is if there's a value up here and you want to use it down here in some other rule, you've got to pass it all the way down like function calls. And the return value's got to you know, pop it all the way back. So anyway, I found that dynamic scoping was really important. The other thing was lazy evaluation was crucial. And just so we're talking about the same thing, by this I mean I've got this massive tree of templates I'm going to dump out eventually. And now I'm making a little substructure over here on the side. And it's referencing the program name. It's referencing all kinds of bizarre stuff that's in this other structure. But I haven't actually stuck it in here yet. So you need it to kind of evaluate at the last second. So I can reference anything I want, but it's only after I've jammed this thing inside this overall structure and then said render. That's when it actually looks at those values. So in that sense, it lazily evaluates. The other thing that really turned out to be useful, yeah? Doesn't the lazy evaluation push the computation back into the, uh, the view where you didn't want it to be? Um, doesn't it pass, the question was, um, doesn't, the, uh, doesn't that pass the computation back into the view? Well, the thing I'm trying to avoid is the kinds of computation. So this expression or this attribute reference is cool whenever we do it in the sense that it doesn't break the rules. It doesn't modify the model. It, um, you know, it, uh, it doesn't affect anything in terms of our um, order of execution and that kind of stuff. So as long as I'm following the rules, timing is okay. Timing doesn't really matter. But the general rule is it's a good question, though, right? Because the general rule is you can compute whatever you want. You just can't do it in the view. But I can reference the results of those computations. In the view. Yes? Have you uh, checked out the Spindle project? Um, uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, Michael Schwartz thought they started off with very similar goals and they developed a whole set of domain specific languages mm -hmm. and architectures for doing very, they have very similar goals for separating uh -huh. logic of web services from, uh, from the, uh, the page design. And um, that's they have a number of very similar goals. What oh, cool. So it's called Bigwig Project? Yeah, then they, then they uh, used to be sort of a standalone language, then they, then they ported the whole idea to Java, and that was called Bigwig. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, yeah, you can, if you search for Bigwig, it's Bigwig. Okay, that sounds cool. Yeah, I'd like to see uh, uh, if we're thinking alike on that. Um, <clears throat> so, inheritance. And as a result, polymorphism of these templates is really useful, too. Um, think about it easily from a, um, a web design point of view. We've got this um, basic site, let's say a JGuru, but we wanted to implement a premium look. It was you know, totally different. Well, if you've got all of your print statements and everything merged into your logic, how, how are you going to change the look? Right? Well, you might get lucky with CSS or something. You can change the color or something or a little bit of the structure. But what we had was... I had a basic design, which was the, the, set of, the collection of templates associated with one skin, you might say, of the site. And then um, I called it a string template group. And then I created another set of templates, which was really just a subclass, as a subgroup. And I changed the templates that I want to change. Well, yeah, search box looks different now, and so on. And I want the, this column over here, and that kind of stuff. So all I have to do is I sense... Uh, when the when the you know the cookie comes in from a, um, another browser, I say, hey, you know, what kind of user is it? If they're premium, I take a big switch and I go, and I just point at a different string template group, and magically the site looks totally different. So, um, well, I won't give you a demo, but anyway, the basic idea is is that you want to be able to subclass things, just so you can change, you know, define by difference, of course. Now, you really need polymorphism. I've got an example of that. Uh, in the code generation world, what this means is, let's say somebody gets the, a new version of the Antler thing, and I've got this cool code generator in there now, and they don't like the way that I've generated uh, 
the code for matching tokens or something. That's what? Just subclass. Well, you can either go in and just modify it, or you can just subclass, or subgroup, I guess you'd call it, the existing code generator templates that I have. Change the rule called, you know, match of token. And then, you know, without even recompiling Antler or whatever, you just rerun it on your grammar, and boom, it'll generate code that's, you know, done according to your, as long as you tell it to use the new subclass, right? Um, so that turns out to be really useful for um, both spaces. Um, you know, given the evidence from my graphics designer who had no problems with this, and she's not a programmer, and also the people at Squarespace, they said that they've never actually had a question on how this template language works. It appears to be obvious. And, of course, it's, um, I've designed it so it strictly separates all this stuff. Um, this should look suspiciously like the description of a uh, functional language, or at least in a lot of the characteristics. And when I started writing up this paper, I thought, my God, what have I done? Because I've always been sort of this you know, basic uh, you know, imperative programming kind of guy. And when I saw that I had sort of built this little functional language in String Template, I kind of freaked out. But you know, it satisfies the requirements. So after evaluating thousands of templates and thinking about code generation for a long time, turns out I only used four things, and I think this is all you need. It's amazing, but true. You need to be able to reference the data value, clearly. You need to be able to reference substructures, whether it's an include, like I've got here, or if there are arguments in there, that would be a macro. The key is this, this template application. If you've got a list of declarations, I need to be able to apply the decal rule or decal template to it. And yeah, I'm glossing over some examples of how that might reference each one of these, but um, actually, I guess here with my anonymous template. So anything in curly braces now is, it's a template that's just anonymous, doesn't have a name. So a lot of times you'll have little snippets of stuff you want to format, but there's no point in making a separate template for it. So this it is the iterator or the thing that gets iterated um, each one of these, you know, decals, this decal, that decal, decal, and so on. And I'm accessing properties of these. So I'm presuming that the declarations that come in are probably symbol table objects, something like that. Whatever it is, they have to answer get type and get name property methods. But anyway, all I'm really doing is putting a space in between them and adding a semicolon. But anyway, this anonymous template stuff is really cool, and I'm going to add a small talk like uh, method argument name there uh, shortly. But anyway, so this is the key structure that allows me to get away with um, out, without doing a whole bunch of template stuff inside my code. You'll see other people using code to generate tables and so on. And then finally, you need to be able to test the presence or absence of an attribute. So if you're generating code for a class and um, you know that there, there's somebody has set a value called superclass, that then and only then do you want this extends keyword followed by the value of that superclass. Because otherwise you'd get extends blank. Right? So you need some form of conditional. But you have to be very careful that this is um, as simple as possible. So as I moved away from the web world, <coughs> thankfully, and back into my comfortable world of code generation, I said, all right, well, this has got to look more and more like a grammar because in the, template or in the web world, you've got like files that represent search box. But in the code generation world, you tend to have a lot of smaller little things. So I said, all right, let's make a syntax, an overall group syntax that allows me to define very quickly and easily a set of templates. So the yellow stuff are the sort of template heads here. And um, so this is defined to be, and then Everything in the angle bracket, double angles, as I said, is a multi-line template, and this is just a little quick one-liner. So um, I'm defining formal arguments. Note if I don't say the type, because then that would tie me to a specific implementation of my code generator. All I know is I'm generating format. I'm not going to do functions on this data, right? So all I care about is that they're formally defined. So clearly this says, you know, what an assignment looks like, an if, and uh, this method call. Notice. This syntax, although I'm not in love with it, it does uh, make a sort of sense. This angle bracket and that angle bracket is just a reference to the list of arguments, but I want to separate them with commas. Because that was such a common operation in, in the web world and also in the code generation world that um, some kind of means of doing that had to be sort of put into the syntax. So, I mean, it, this makes a lot of sense, right? When, I mean, think about, you know, when I, I built the original version of Antler, um, <clears throat> the previous version, 
in the documentation, I'd say, well, here's what um, you know, rule generator, a generated rule looks like. Here's what a, an, assort, um, like a, an alternative list looks like. And I'm generating all these little templates in the documentation. Well, the documentation should be executable. And that's what this is. This is executable documentation. I mean, it's clear that um, a method looks like, you know, public all by the type, all by the name. And if there are no arguments, then it's just blank. And then you get left, right, parenthesis. And then, you know, the optional bodies inside. So my goal is to sort of formalize the documentation that we've all been generating and make it executable. So <clears throat> quick example of polymorphism. This always gets my students. You know, the whole idea that uh, you have uh, something in the superclass, well, supergroup, a statement list that references assignment. So it can either call this or it can call that. I've just made these literals just so we can see this easily. So depending on which group you create this S list in, it'll call this or it'll call that. So here, if I have a supergroup and I say, you know, by the way, my supergroup is this thing, and I create an instance of S list via the subgroup, it doesn't see it here, so it goes to its superclass supergroup and gets the definition of S list. So think of it as just literally virtual methods, right? Late binding. And then because I created it from here, when I render this thing to string, you'll see that it's this is going to call back down to the subclass because that's where it starts to do the name, name resolution. Yeah. Can the, uh, can the subclass reference the superclass or is it just yes. a hiding thing? It can reference it. You can say, like if you wanted to, you could say, make the assignment in the subgroup y equals 1 semicolon and then whatever the superclass would have done, you can say super dot assign left right parenthesis. I just added that the other day. Because it, it's a cool way for you to, uh, I was thinking, oh, well, how am I going to add, uh, say, tree generation to the basic parsers that I generate? Well, I know, I'll subclass it, and then I'll reference, let's say, match. So what I'll do is um, I'll reference what used to be done for match, and then I'll put some tree generation stuff around it. Another example is that if you want to generate a, uh, a program that has a code at the beginning and the end of every function, you could override Exactly. The right, like for tracing. You want to trace in, trace out, something like that. Yeah, it's really great for that. Um, and, well, yeah, even then you could just reference. Let's say you could, you could, this is the same as like a, a virtual function that doesn't do anything. If you just make this blank, then um, that means that by default there is no assignment. But this could be like a trace in, trace out. Um, in a sense, yeah, a blank spring, but it, it wouldn't generate an error. It would just give you a blank. It, would, it wouldn't say that method isn't defined. So you can give it default behavior, which is say nothing, and then only in subclasses will you get, say, the trace in, trace out. So it does very much what you'd expect of a sort of an object-oriented language. And, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I mean, obviously I like it, I, I built it, but it's, it's just more interesting to me than these, th these other engines that I see that are the designed by you know, arguably really bright people, they're just programmers though. They haven't really, you know, they don't, they're not steeped in, you know, languages and, I mean, this just, it just works, right? The arguments do what you'd expect, inheritance does what you expect. I mean, it just, it just does what you expect. So, um, <clears throat> I find, uh, I don't like surprises. And so, anyway, so that's a, a simple example of the polymorphism. So, I tried to think of an example that I could show easily in a couple of slides that would be arguably interesting but wouldn't require that we all think about some weird, you know, compiler model or something like that. So I said, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm going to make a dummy Java class called Dump. I'm going to add some bogus fields in here and um, some bogus methods, and then I'll make a main in there that knows how to dump itself out using reflection. So the reflection model within Java is going to be, well, the model. My main is going to be my controller that actually pulls from the model and pushes into the templates. So I'm going to have a bunch of templates to say, what does a class look like? What are all the fields? That, you know, how, what does a field look like? What does a method decal look like? So this is the output of a program using Java templates and a little bit of Java. Here are the templates. I mean, uh, I guess you don't have to look too carefully, but, you know, like a field. Well, uh, gee, this can't be too hard to look at. Um, public followed by the type. And notice um, type is another rule that I'm passing an argument into. And it's checking whether it's a component type. If so, I have to add the, uh, the it's an array, basically, right? So I add the left and right brackets. Um, otherwise, it's just the name of the type. But anyway, so whatever I get the type, and then I spit out the name. 
So notice I'm using this, this it thing, this iterator. So that means this field can be applied to <clears throat> a list of fields that come in. Who is it, um, it is the default. It's kind of like the this. But I didn't want to use this because it was it'd be too confusing because it wasn't right. It wasn't exactly this, right? So it, it's the default value that iterates. It's like for each. If you do like uh, f you know for each n of names, it is the yeah. Yeah. right. It is whatever is applied. Yeah, well, it, it's usually a list, but it could be a single value. So whenever field is applied, say here. There's a list of things coming in. That's just literally, you'll see in a second in the Java code, it's an array of field objects. And then I'm a, pulling out the property type and name. So it will be the first field object, the second field object, the third field object, as it iterates through this list. Uh, I, so, so I can really think of it as really being bound up in field, colon, field. That's right, in this case. Or somewhere else. That's right, exactly. Right, wherever the uh, invocation is. Yeah, and this is uh, this is kind of annoying. I just decided that really you should define and the, whatever the first argument is, that should be the name that iterates through. Certainly for here, when I have a uh, uh, an anonymous block, I should do like small talk. But I'm sorry, you had a question, I think. Uh, yes. So if I wanted to. Uh, well, it depends on yeah, it depends on what exactly you mean, you mean by that. But I mean, I well, one of the things you can do is repeated uh, things like so. If I have a list of declarations and I apply field to it, it returns not a bunch of text, but it returns another list of well, uh, it returns um, template objects in implementation. But you can think of it as just modified data values. So it's literally you take one list and you morph it into another, and then you can hit it with another colon and apply another set of things to it. And if, for example, type was a, uh, well, let's see. Yeah, if name was a list also, you could iterate through that within this, within this particular template and so on. That is true, actually, yes. And then, yeah, once I get the parameter thing set up, then it'll be much better. Yeah, this, this kind of evolved out of the time when I didn't have formal method or template definitions because I just had files. There was no like header on it. It was just like HTML in a file with a with holes in it. So as I move it closer and closer to what I want, um, this it will become less and less fashionable. It used to be worse. It used to be called Atter, A T T R. What? That's crazy. But anyway. So let's look at the code real quick. So the, this is all just your basic Java craft. You remember those? This is what I dumped out. That's part of the output. And then here's the controller. And this is just the usual thing. I want to get a string template group, and I'm loading from that string template file. Um, but here's where it is. Here's where I'm pulling the model. So the, the Java reflection model is you ask, you know, this, I'm asking myself, the class definition. I'm asking for the fields and for the declared methods. And then I'm asking this group that I, you know, the previous list of things, I'm asking for the definition of a class. What does it look like? You get that thing. And, uh, and then I'm stuffing name fields and methods, uh, let's see, of this, this class template. And you'll see that those are the formal arguments. And then all I do is ask it to render. Yes? There's not going to be any static type checking here since you're Nothing. Public. Yeah, in this case, I'm not, I, and, you know, I'm just coming up with a bogus example. I'm just dumping stuff. It's, it's actually too stupid to work. So I chose this example carefully so it would actually work for this case. But I'm just trying to generate uh, this. But is this a general pattern that, that the way that you're going to use string templates is the reflection and, and that the, the width? I mean, the interesting thing about doing the separation of concerns, right, is that your, your template, there's a type system in your Java language, and then there's the type system of your templates. And, and essentially, um, you don't have a type checker that sort of crosses those two. Yeah, right. Right. That's right. So if method isn't a collection, something will happen, yeah. right? And yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so it's, um, it's uh, what well, we'll call it dynamic rather than non-type check. But in most cases, that's the way you want it. Um, but, uh, uh, right. Yeah, it's, it's not about verifying, you know, types between the systems and all. But well, well, when I get to the antler part real quick, I'll... Uh, 
I'll show what I mean. But anyway, so here's the cool part, right? Okay, I have um, decoupled totally the view of that Java via those templates versus this code. Now, so for the sleight of hand, what if we want this? What if we want to dump it out as XML? You know, arguably you want to, you know, you want to freeze dry an object or something um, in a different format. This is what you might do. Well, all you got to do, without changing the code at all, all you have to do is tell it to load a different set of templates that, you know, follow the same uh, protocol, if you will, or interface. But they look totally different, right? Field now looks like a bunch of XML junk. Oh, and notice that I switched to dollar dollar as the delimiter simply because it sticks out more in XML than the angle brackets, obviously. Um, and that's done with a, a simple parameter. So anyway, so hopefully it makes it sticks out, stick out more. But um, so anyway, as you can see, intellectually anyway, without some of the deals, you just switch the templates and boom, it comes out differently. How do you escape the angle brackets in your other syntax? Uh, escape. And it was, yeah, back, backslash less than. Okay. Right. That's the only thing that it, it sees outside of a less than. It ignores everything outside except that one, one simple thing you need to escape it. So in this case, you'd use dollar, or backslash dollar to escape that thing. And then backslash backslash. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So let's see. Let me just give you a little bit of experience with this so far, and then I can wrap up. Um, <clears throat> building the code generator, you know, especially after the old version of the code generator for Antler, I'm just doing the happy dance. I mean, I'm running through my office jumping for joy as I use this thing because it's just so clean when I want to change something. I go, oh, that's, you know, that's part of the output, so I go tweak the output. I'm like, oh, you know, I really need to uh, add a variable here to track this. Oh, no sweat. I just stick it in here. The code generator is going to be generic for all languages that I'm going to generate. <laughs> Now, naturally, just like when you're building a library, you've got to make sure the library is capable of a bunch of stuff, even if you don't use it all. So clearly, when I get this thing, the code generator, sufficiently sophisticated so that it can generate C, it'll have to be able to generate separate files for headers and so on. Now, the Java code generator templates won't use that. That's just fine. They just won't use it. Okay, so the code generator will get more and more sophisticated so it'll be able to handle everything from Lisp through you know, Sather. So, um, one of the, the key points that I've learned just from experience is that, see, originally I thought, oh, output grammar. Just like an input grammar, we're going to use it as like the main thing, right? It's going to pull tokens from the lexer and it's going to apply grammatical structure and so on. Turns out it's not really the right way to think about output templates because then you think of this output grammar <clears throat> as actually itself traversing the model. But the model is way too complicated. I mean, it could be a database, right? It might not be um, some abstract syntax tree in memory. So I don't think about the actual output grammar as driving this whole thing. I've, this, the MVC model really breaks this down nicely. So I've got a tree walker, so I build in Antler a grammar that describes my trees of itself. And then I walk it with a tree walker. And when it's convenient, for the tree walker, it computes these substructures that are going to go to the output. How do you generate a rule? How do you generate an alternative lock? It does, the controller does what it wants efficiently and conveniently, gradually building up this output structure of nested templates, okay, which is the view. And then the model is my abstract syntax tree that represents your grammar. And then I walk it and go, oh, yeah, here's a reference to a rule. Essentially generate a function call because I built top-down parsers. And so this, the, the tree walker is the controller, not the output grammar. The output grammar is just the view. And then the model is my abstract syntax tree. And decoupling that order of computation is just, it, it can't be underestimated. Because a lot of things, you know, the, the, uh, the data, the model should dictate how you walk it and pull stuff out of it. You don't want the order of the output language to dictate how you walk your model because it's two totally different structures. Imagine if you're walking a database that's somehow in reverse order and you want to dump code in some other, you know, the inverse order, right? They're two totally separate things. So you want to decouple that order. And so far I've been really, really happy with uh, the fact that I'm going to be able to retarget this thing by just swapping in another template file.
And like I said, the, the idea of executable documentation is fabulous. All that stuff that I had in the documentation about, well, here's how a rule gets generated. Here's how the overall file gets generated. Well, let's just, you know, let's just make it the, the code. So here's just one of the, the, the templates that I yanked out of my code generator. Um, a parser has got a name and a list of tokens and rules and DFAs that do uh, some prediction for me. But uh, so, I mean, this is a pretty clear idea of what's going on. Ignore this for a second here. Um, just making a constructor, passes in an input stream of tokens, and uh, then the rules get dumped out, and then the DFAs get dumped out, and then the end of the class. You know, there's no reason why we shouldn't be coding this way. Now, here's an anonymous template that I'm applying to this list of objects that came in. So tokens is part of my symbol table, and these objects know how to answer get name and get type. And so I'm just spitting out my, constant, my token definitions, token type definitions at the beginning of my class. Okay, so you get a whole list of public static final int blah, blah, blah. I don't know why we didn't come up with a const keyword, but such as it is, that's, what, that's how you say const. And, uh, and then just you know, do the assignment like you know, ID 46, begin 47, and so on. So, I mean, that's it. That's, that's a big part of the code generator right there. So all your code generator has to do is come up with this data in a convenient form, and then it goes and dumps out. So the DFAs come in here as a simple string then? No. It's coming in actually as, there's, a, there's another rule called DFA. Well, actually a bunch of them because it actually builds this graph. Okay. So, so it comes in as actually a list of template objects that are already, so that's how you get this, this nested structure. You get the overall parser that's got some stuff. And then it's got a list of other templates underneath for DFAs and for the rules. Okay, so if this guy didn't reference DFAs based on your lazy evaluation, it would never even be computed. That's right. Well, no, I'm sorry. It would be computed, but it wouldn't be, it would just be okay, so, in the output. So, so by lazy, you mean when it's referenced as you're passing it into a, into a, a, a sub-template, right? Yeah, let's see. Um, I guess the way to look at it is let's say you've got a whole bunch of DFAs and it's a list of them on the side. You haven't hooked them in here yet. As soon as you pass them into something, even if that thing uses it or not, you're going to compute them, right? Um, let's see. Well, all the data is computed beforehand. So I've got these lists first. Let's say, so these DFAs could reference name, even though they're not in here yet. So I'm building, I'm building it bottom up, which is kind of interesting. Oh, um, so that's what you meant by the dynamic scoping. Right, exactly. Is that... So I can see anybody's scope that's enclosing me. So, so tokens def doesn't necessarily have to be passed in here if the guy who's calling parser defines the tokens. That's originally the way to find it, um, and that's generally the rule. However, it turns out um, this, because you're saying this is a formal tokens coming in, I'm hiding any previous scope, because it turns right, out you right. get infinite structures very easily, I found out the hard way. Um, because you can forget to define something, and you're like, oh, I can't even debug this thing because it blows up the stack before I can print it out. However, if I didn't say tokens, then yes, it would totally inherit from wherever it, wherever it was enclosed. Okay. Exactly. So could you, could, you, could you give us an example why you needed the dynamic scoping? Because it seems like you can pass everything as formal arguments. And yes, you can. The uh, program's more robust because if you see a thing in a different place where you don't have a certain... Yeah, if DFA references name, and you use it in a place where, DF, where name's not defined, they can run from crash, right? Yeah, you, you, basically, um, I'm coming to the conclusion more and more that sometimes that dynamic scoping is really useful, and sometimes it can get you into these weird uh, infinitely recursive structures, or it can introduce a bug. So that is it really useful? Well, let's see. So it was really useful in the old here. world, in the, in the web world, when, like, you set the font once in the overall page, and then any sub-temple, like for tables, could reuse that. So that's a clear use of when it is useful. Now, in the code generation world, I'm coming more and more towards this formalism that, you know, you want to be careful. Like, for example, unless there's a formal argument, you can't set that attribute, right? It's saying, here is the set of things that I understand. So you might be able to set it above, but if you make an instance of this template, there's no way to set any value that's not listed in this formal argument list. So that's clear, is that you, want, you don't want to just randomly, because you run into all sorts of problems, like you mistype the name of an attribute. I mean, so you've got to catch a lot of those bugs. So an example in the code generation world um, where dynamic scoping is useful. It turns out it's useful for little things, like what's the name of the program I'm in? 
sometimes you use that to generate unique variables, or like I was saying, the method name, or something like that. Um, there's, uh, it, but it's not really useful when there's lists of stuff like these DFAs. You want to be really careful um, that you don't magically, because let's say you're a statement list, and you li you got curly statement list, right curly. Well, you can get into a thing where you forget to pass in the list of statements, and you're inheriting from the statement list around you. So then you include yourself. Now I added in lint mode. You can turn on lint mode, and it'll actually detect cycles in the structure of the tree, and tell you you know how that happened. But um, yeah, so it's becoming less and less useful um, the more I dig into it. But there are certain cases where it is useful. I could probably start some of this by introducing global. Yes. In a, sense, in a sense, yeah, that's just like a one level of uh, right, right. dynamic token. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, given that there's no assignment in the uh, templates themselves, doesn't that make the dynamic token kind of amount to an implicit reference to memory? I can just access what I want. It's been already defined. Um, not sure what angle you're getting at. Um, assignments are bad because they specify kind of an order. They, they come up with a dependency. And in fact, uh, many of you may be familiar with this whole argument of push versus pull, where a lot of template engines would have <coughs> this thing actually going into the model. You know, like this could this. It could be like the database, and it could access directly and pull stuff out of the database or whatever. But it turns out that if you're calling arbitrary methods to get properties and stuff like that, or data out of the model, there are inherent um, dependencies, right? So before you actually compute anything, you have to make sure that the order that's going to happen in the view is the proper order of method calls. You know how it is. Like, let's here's a simple example that, that breaks down. So let's say you're generating some web page, and the um, you're making a list of names or something. So, you know, um, it pulls the list of names and, and prints. And at the bottom, you want to say how many you printed. Well, that's easy. You've already computed the list, so you can just ask for its size. Now, the graphics designer comes along and goes, hey, I want that in the title. Now you're calling get size before the list has been, say, pulled from the database. So you're either going to crash at worst or be at best, um, you know, something. So what you end up doing, of course, is the programmers always say, oh, well, that's easy. I'll just make sure that get size always computes the list first, and then, you know, well, I mean, you have to, in your mind, you have to topologically sort all this, right? I mean, this is just nonsense. So in the worst case, there's a simple little proof in here where you can show that in the absolute worst case to be safe, um, you have to compute everything first, if, depending on a particular, particular dependency graph. You have to compute everything first anyway to be safe, so you might as well just make that the damn model, all right? So, but in your case, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, so um, can, can you rephrase it for me, maybe? Well, is there any difference semantically from the dynamic scoping, given that there's no assignment, and just passing in everything we have to the lower level? Um, well, assignment, again, it's like, um, I mean, you kind of, you can do assignments like when you're doing argument passing down. So it's basically the assignment thing I don't like is the fact that it sets up these dependencies that um, this has to be used before this and so on, whereas just making them all available is sort of the same thing. You're having these things available, but it's not setting up any kind of dependency. And the other thing is assignments between attributes would be okay because all the data has already been computed, and you're just like shuffling tokens around, essentially. So I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering your question. But. So who opens the file? Uh, is the, it template? Part of the template language or is it part of the controlling code? Part of the controller. Uh, let's see. So, so if you were switching between, you know, C sharp and Java here and C plus oh, plus. sorry. It's really up to the. Yeah, it's up to the controller. So, so for example, um, this is a little more complicated than it would normally be because of legacy support, but this is just. Pulling out a file from memory. So, uh, well, I'm talking about for the output file. Yeah. Oh, oh, for the output file. Oh, yeah, it's totally up to you. Here it is. Basically, you get a string when you run, you know, when you say render the string, and then it's up to you to do whatever you want. So, so you know, in your example of retargeting your code generator to C sharp instead of Java, you couldn't do it purely with the templates because right. you have to hook it in. And yeah, you've got to have some mechanism. All it does is give you the right stuff. 
where you stick it, it's up to you. And and if you were going to go to like Michael Watts Socket, you were going to go to C, then and you're generating header header files and, and C files, you have to actually instantiate the template engine twice for each one. Is that? It's something like that. That's correct. You, um, it's not a, a complete solution in the sense that, um, you know, that little bit of where you stick the output and how many output files you create. I kind of figured there's no reason to put that into the tool because you can't possibly be flexible enough, and you might as well let the controller do that. For example, if this is a part of a web server, you know, it's got to go out of socket. And so, yeah, I haven't actually gotten to the C generator yet, and when I do, then I'm going to run into this problem of well, the Java doesn't need these things, so how do you make it generic that it knows how to which files to create? So that'll be something I'm attacking within the next month or so to figure out what the right answer is. But it's part of the controller code at this point. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just shuffling. So, yeah, so I, I try to build tools that, you know, don't do everything and in four lines. I try to, uh, you know, give something to the average programmer that they can use that helps them do their, their tasks and make it you know, easy to fold into their stuff and it doesn't have a whole bunch of requirements and so on. Keep it as simple as possible. I mean, the whole thing's like the, the whole functional language and all the template stuff and all the parsers is like uh, just over 100K. I mean, maybe now it's like 150K or something with the doc and the class files and the output binaries. So it's, it's very simple. And you know, when you put other infrastructure around it, such as I did to build these websites, to me, websites were state machines. So combined with these templates, then each node in my state machine had a template, and uh, so on. So it, it, um, it's up to you to put stuff around it. I have more questions if no one wants to Yeah, go for it. So you mentioned earlier that you think that XSLT is not a templating engine mm -hmm. um, in, in the way that you've defined it. So we've done something um, at, at one point that was very similar to what you have here, mm -hmm. where you define a bunch of essentially replacement macros that, that can, and, and we drove that using X, you know, using a, a subset of XSLT. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you say that XSLT is not a, a, a templating engine because generally it's driven as a file-to-file -file transfer combined with the fact that you can actually access outside your scope and look around your data model? Or I say it's not a template simply because it's a set of rewrite rules. <clears throat> so you have to imagine the emergent behavior. It's not like this brain in template thing where we just kind of say, well, here's, here's the output and there's some holes in it. So now, if you did it that way, right, imagine um, if you somehow had a well, doc... You can pass arguments into SSLT templates. Right, but you're specifying rules, right? When you see, um, you know, name nested in this thing, then, then rewrite it to be this, right? Or generate this, out, uh, output XML or something, right? So, you know, yeah, you don't have to use it that way. I mean, we're using it to generate. I see. Okay. C so there, there may be like a mode or something like that that is uh, is much more akin to a template. Yeah. So you can yeah. So in, in, in SSLT, you can name templates, name parameters into those templates, and essentially they become a you know. A, that's, so that's like a macro, and that's fine. But that's not really driving the whole thing, is it? Uh, you can you can call the individual templates from code if you want to. I see. The output to a string. Essentially, what you're doing. Okay. Okay. So I think, I so think that's, that, that's that's cleaner. So I should be that there is a mode that you can you know you can use XSLT in this way and maybe restrict some of the feature set and get a lot of the same thing. Right. In fact, we we came up with our our own language that looked you know somewhat similar to what you're defining, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't XSLT directly, but we translated to XSLT. Sure. And then whereas you have simple uh, key value pairs for your data types, we're using XPath to actually do a, a, a rich query into the data model, right. which you know is 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 uh, uh, um, it's kind of putting part of the controller, maybe even part of the model, into the view. So while that may be handy, it, it, I'd have to look at it, but it might start to get to the point where you're secretly embedding part of the logic. Because imagine this, your, those templates then, if they're doing paths, uh, back into queries, back into the original yeah, data. Yeah, if they're actually doing dot dot up the up right, the then they're, yeah. then so, they're tied so that's to what I'm saying. You might want to trick the the, right. the XPath syntax so that you're only looking at your node and the descendants right. of your node, which is your rich data model under your under yourself, which is essentially similar to your iterator, but at least that's right. dotting down deeper there. Right. So this gets gets me basically to my point on all of this. Hey. That enforcing it provides you a lot of. Yeah, basically what it is is we all came up with the same solution, right? We all realized that something's got to be better than doing a bunch of print statements. And so we all came up with the idea of uh, templates. 
And my point is that, um, okay, we all agree that the nature of the problem is such that a template, output grammar, whatever you want to call it, the nature of the problem says template. However, if you look at it from the other side, if you just make any unrestricted template, you get into a lot of trouble and you don't necessarily get a more interesting solution. However, if you start to restrict and you ruthlessly enforce this restriction of uh, separating these concerns, then it turns out, fascinatingly, that it drives you towards the same thing, that this solution must look like a grammar and restricted in that way. And, uh, you know, when it is so, so restricted, you get all sorts of interesting... Uh, I mean, it, the simplicity really speaks to me. So, anyway, this is, uh, although there is a C-sharp port of an older version, um, I just released the 2.0. Hopefully somebody will uh, port it again. Um, but anyway, so it's free. You can play with it, do whatever you like, BSD license. And um, it will be eventually merged into the new version of Antler as kind of a normal component for generating code. And now there are other cases where, you know, like if you just want to... Um, take a Java program or a C-sharp program or a basic or whatever and just kind of tweak it, like insert profiling code and so on, there are actually better ways. So if in special cases, you can do a lot better. I have something called the token stream rewrite engine. Uh, it, it's like a little uh, cool little tool that lets you basically parse a bunch of stuff and then insert stuff in between tokens and rewrite and so on. That actually does a much more efficient job than having to build a tree and dump your own stuff. But in general, I find that something that looks like a grammar and something that's restricted to work like a grammar in terms of its actions um, is really the best solution. So, so I'll be hanging around this afternoon if anybody wants to uh, chit chat more about this stuff or antler or whatever. Well, thanks very much.